I encourage you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll begin at verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. As you turn to there, I wanted to remind you that on uh, Saturday evening at 6.30, Pastor Wes and Sarah are having a spaghetti dinner fundraiser. They're paying for the dinner themselves and are inviting us to join them uh, with a goal of raising up to $40,000 for their mission trip, year-long mission trip to Northern Ireland. If you can come, we'd love to know that. And you're calling the office to let us know or emailing the office to let us know that you're coming will we'll allow us to help him prepare for the dinner and to make sure that we have enough food and, and enough tables set up. If you can only afford to donate $10, they would love to tell you about what it is that's taking place in Northern Ireland and what it is that they're going to be engaged in. If you can afford $100, that's great. If you can afford $1,000, that's great. We want you to come and give as the Lord directs, and we know that you will support them. And then also, on next Monday night, July 20th at 7 o'clock at the Columbia First Church of the Nazarene, Pastor Wes is going to be ordained elder in the church. And we know that you will want to participate in that and support him. And uh, I know that he would love to see you there. And any of you that can be there, we would love uh, to see you there and celebrate with Pastor Wes and Sarah. These are huge days in their life. And we know that you will want to support him as uh, they move that direction. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our heavenly home is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, We make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Father, may the words of your scripture not just inform us, may they form us. May we not gather to learn so much as to open the door of our heart and give you permission to transform us. So may we live differently this week because through your word you have spoken to us. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2001, October of 2001, my call came to be the senior pastor of the Grove City, Pennsylvania Church of the Nazarene, and it was in October My wife and I were beginning to make plans for our annual two-week camping trip, and my wife had never been to any ocean. And so we decided to begin this uh, journey toward the ocean, and so we decided that since we were driving through the Gettysburg, Philadelphia area, that we would stop for about five, six days there and uh, do some sightseeing of Gettysburg, Philadelphia, check out the Liberty Bell, and then head to Delaware Seashore State Park for a week of camping at the ocean. We have been to the ocean every year since, and my wife has fallen in love, but we haven't been back to Philadelphia. We, we uh, set up our tent outside of Philadelphia, we were doing some of the sites, and in our, in our touristy uh, travelings there, we, we, we got word that this uh, tropical storm was coming, and they had issued tropical storm warnings, severe thunderstorm warnings, flood warnings. We were in for the ride of our life. Now, we are in a tent, folks, and my tent package said water resistant, and that is a far cry from waterproof, you know, and uh, so I... I being a young man, my, my daughters were six and eight at the time, I did not want to be bested by Mother Nature. 
And so I decided that it was not going to best our family. And I'm strategizing in my mind, how am I going to keep the rain out of our tent? So we went to Walmart, and I got three tarps. One, we, we wrapped around the one side just past the halfway mark. We staked it down all around, we're throwing ropes over, staking those down. Then I put another one on the other side and overlapped it on that. Then I covered the thing with a third tarp, and I stood back, thumped my chest. Who's the man? <laughs> my daughters are like, you are, Daddy. And I'm like, yeah. it, was, it was a moment of glory and pride in my life as I stood there at this masterpiece. We, we saw the sun beginning to set. We heard the thunder begin to rumble in the background. And in the tent we went and we zipped it shut. I was going to beat Mother Nature that day. And I was proud when I went into that tent. The rain began to gently fall. The storm began to accelerate. The wind began to howl. And in order to distract our children, we decided to play a game on their side of the tent. On their side, they had two cots that were elevated, all the luggage, and a double mattress was on our side of the tent, which allowed for us to play games on their side. We're seated there. The sound was deafening. The rain on the tarp, the thunder, and the, the lightning flashes, and it was intense. It just went on and on and on. Finally, we'd had enough of the games, and the girls were getting tired, and it was time for bed. And we walked over to our side of the tent after we tucked them in and kissed them goodnight, and, and I stepped in water. <laughs> and I'm like, where is this coming from? I'm looking all over the tent. Where is the water coming from? And I finally looked toward the front door, the only exposed piece of our tent. You know where the zippers come together? You have that tiny little hole. Well, water is like squirting through like the hose on your sink, just squirting through this. And I unzip the tent. We have a, an overhang that protects the front door. I unzip the tent and whoosh, the water comes, leaves and water and dirt and pine needles just come whooshing into the tent. I throw off my shirt. I jump outside and zip it shut. And, and I'm grabbing firewood and trying to block this infernal a uh, cascade of water. Our tent is now in a, uh, a storm-induced creek, and the water is just rushing at our tent. I was able to get the firewood stacked up in such a way that the, the water began to divert from our front door. So when I opened it again and stepped in, I'm soaked. I discovered dirt and leaves and pine needles. Our suitcases are underwater, and and you know, you have an air mattress on the ground, your, your blankets are over, touching the ground, and so they were absorbing the water. And so there was this dry spot in the middle that my wife and I tried to share. I'm soaked, I have no clean clothes, no dry clothes, and we just huddled there till morning. We went to the laundromat, and the weather guy said, there's another tropical storm coming in two days. And my wife, with tears in her eyes, said, could we just get a hotel this time? <laughs> I'm like, sure. So we packed it in. Mother Nature bested me. Uh, people ask my wife when they hear about our camping stories, why did you keep going with him? Uh, why, why did you keep enduring that? You see, I, I love to fish on the ocean, and, and I... I I, by the end of the vacation, one of the reasons I come back from my vacation on a Monday is it takes a week to get the smell out of me. I, the, the squid, I can't wash the squid out of my hands. It just stinks. And, and people commiserate with my wife. Why do you keep doing it? Well, now we tow a tent, uh, our tent behind us. It's called a camper, which is much nicer. We don't uh, do tent camping anymore. We do a trailer camping now. But people tell my wife, I, w I won't ever do it. Not even a camper. Give me a, give me a condo. Give me a house. Give me something. I'm not doing this tent kind of camping. And I would venture to guess that most people would relate to my wife. I'm not doing this tent thing. But it brings me to the first lesson of this morning. Are you building a tent or a house? Spiritually speaking. We... we in the physical world, if I'm going on vacation, the last thing I'm going to want to do is, is go in a tent. At least that's what most people would say. But in the spiritual world, a lot of us in, 
invest in the tent instead of the house. The tent and the house in this passage are metaphors. They're symbols for something else. The tent is that which symbolizes our investment in the temporal, the physical, this world, this life, our, our, our temporary things. The house stands for that which is eternal, built in the heavens, kept in the heavens, that never perishes, spoils, or fade. These are eternal things. Are you, as you look over the past seven days, what have you built? If you, if you consider that in your life which is temporal, that in your life which is eternal, if you, if you think about the things that you've done, the things that you've said, the things that you've valued, the way in which you've spent your, your time, the way you've invested your talents, the way that you've invested in relationship, would, would you say that you've been building a tent, that which is temporal, that which is physical, that which is in the here and now, or would you say you're investing in that which is eternal? The Lord calls us to invest in that which is eternal. The Lord calls us to invest in things that matter. When, when it comes to our time, how is it that we spend our time? Do you, do you live with a vision as it relates to your time so that you're not so obsessed with that which is temporary, that which is the here and now? Are you so obsessed with getting to do what you want to do that you don't even begin to consider, God, how do you want me to spend the time that you have entrusted to me this day? God, how is it that you want me to expend that which you have entrusted to me this day? Or, or is the search for acquisition so that way you can just do more for yourself? Is, now, there's nothing wrong with doing things for yourself, but what motivates you? What captures your imagination? What is it that motivates your life? Are you motivated by selfish or are you motivated by building God's kingdom, by building that which is eternal? The talents that you have, do you, do you use those talents to, to make an eternal difference? Or do you use those talents to make yourself look good so that people will applaud you and, and appreciate you? How do you spend your life? How do you spend your life? The question is important because what we build eternally matters. You hear the story of me wrapping my tent, which is, let's be honest, only a young guy would try to pull a stunt like that, right? My poor wife and children, uh, you're the man. Well, thankfully, they didn't tell me, well, I guess you're not the man after that was over. <laughs> thank you. I don't know that I ever said thank you, but she never said that. Uh, she never called me ridiculous when I had these m macho moments. But that's how we live life. We, we, we try to, 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 to fight that which is temporal and make it eternal. It, we, last year we were at uh, uh, Little Talbot Island as a family, and one of the things my daughters and I love to do is we love to build a castle near the surf line at low tide because then the high tide starts coming in and and demolishes it and then, I don't know we just love watching the 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 sand castle get demolished we this past year we built multiple castles within castles with multiple moats between moats and and as the tide came in it hit the first moat we were cheering and people were looking at us funny and uh, but then it hit the first wall destroyed that but the inside was still there and and uh, it hit that moat and then began to whittle away at the wall and then the interior uh, went away and my wife was like, is it time to go yet? Uh, but we're cheering that this tent is, or this uh, sandcastle is being demolished. We, for some reason, we like to fight the, the, the concept of the tent and make the tent something more than it really is when the truth of the matter is God's kingdom needs built, and life is like the surf that comes in and destroys that castle. The tent is going to go away. It is going to go away. The Bible does tell us that we are to take care of this body because it has been entrusted to us. I'm not suggesting that you not take care of your body or that the physical is irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. But, but if we 
if we are living our life in such a fashion that, that the temporary, the temporal, the physical is all that we focus on, we're going to be neglecting the eternal. My fifth grade boy's Sunday school teacher was Orville Babs, loved the man. We were sticking pencils up our nose. He would stick pencils up his nose with us. Loved the man. He introduced me to Jesus. JB, he's now in heaven. J.B. Duke was a, was a man I grew to love in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was a man's man if you ever met a man's man. Cowboy boots, big cowboy buckle. He, he drove a candy apple red F-150 super crew lariat that made you just go, ho, 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 ho. It was a manly, manly truck. But when he talked about Jesus... The tears flowed down his face. He helped me know you can be a manly man who is in l desperate love with Jesus. And there was Brenda Williams. She's with the Lord. Cancer took her. She had a vision for how it is that God wanted her to invest so that after she died, that investment would get unleashed on the kingdom of God. And when she passed away, everybody was stunned by what it was that she had done with a vision for the kingdom of God that went beyond her death. Those folks had an idea about what it meant to build God's kingdom, to invest in the eternal, and all of their lives still impact me today. Long after they're gone, why does, the, why does this tent or house matter? Because, folks, if, if we don't, a year after we're gone, if we don't wrestle with this a year after we're gone, our lives are going to be quickly irrelevant. If we don't invest in the eternal, a year after our death, our life won't matter. Now, we don't do this because we are trying to build this, this uh, great mansion in heaven for ourselves. We don't do this because we want our legacy to perpetuate. We do this house building, this eternal house building, not motivated by self-centered goals because we're just going to end up in the same place. We, we engage in this house building because that which is eternal matters to God. We love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love other people as, as we love, excuse me, love Christ. And if, if that is our motive, then we're going to keep building the house because it matters to God. And because this life matters, we commit to the unseen. We commit to walk by faith. You guys have heard the, the, the saying, the squeaky uh, wheel gets the grease. God doesn't work that way. A year ago, we stopped uh, our cable subscription. We stopped it a month before sabbatical. I didn't want to pay for cable for six weeks when I wasn't home using it. So... My wife and I talked. We said, let's just get rid of it a, a month before sabbatical and just see what happens. A funny thing happened that I didn't expect. I love watching golf, but every time I watched golf, I found out that my game could be better if I just bought this product. The latest driver, the latest putter, the latest gadget, the latest training video, and every time I watched golf, I discovered why I deserved to buy what this new product was telling me. I, I'm going to drive longer, and I'm never the longest driver on a golf course. So if I buy the new driver, maybe I'll get closer. And so you'd be, you'd be living with a spirit of discontent. I love watching hunting shows and and the latest gadgets, the latest gear. And every time I looked at the latest gadget and the latest gear on television, I discovered why I didn't have what it is that I deserved to have. And it bred a spirit of discontent. Funny thing, no one on television ever asked me to live by faith. They never did. They never said, instead of buying our product, why don't you go love somebody in Jesus' name? They never said, instead of making this expense, why don't you go to the grocery store and pay for somebody's groceries? 
the squeaky wheel of our culture gets greased because it keeps pressing in on us and, and tries to drive us to invest in that which is temporal. When, when God whispers, he asks us to, to live by faith. And the world is committed to getting us to live by sight. It doesn't want us to live by faith. Keith Miller and Bruce Larson, in their book, The Edge of Adventure, tell the following story. A letter was found in a baking powder can wired to the handle of an old pump that offered the only hope of drinking water on a long but seldom used trail across Nevada's Armagosa Desert. The note said this, quote, This pump is all right as of June 1932. I put a new sucker washer into it, and it ought to last five years, but the washer dries out, and the pump has got to be primed. Under the white rock, I buried a bottle of water out of the sun and cork end up. There's enough water in it to prime the pump, but not if you drink some first. Pour about one-fourth and let her soak wet the, letter, the leather. Then pour the rest medium fast and pump like crazy. You'll get water. The well is never run dry. Have faith. When you get watered up, fill the bottle. Put it back like you found it for the next feller. Signed, Desert Pete. P.S. Don't go drinking the water first. Prime the pump and you'll get all you can hold. If you walked up to the pump and you read the note and you are so thirsty you can barely stand it and the note says, prime the pump, would you prime it or would you drink it? I would, I would venture the guess probably too many folks would just drink it because there's a great risk. If I pour the water to wet the leather and prime the pump, will I not have my thirst met? This pump has never gone dry, so says Desert Pete, but what if this is the moment when Desert Pete's wrong? I'm a dead man, a dead woman. The reason a lot of people may be living life in the tent is because they don't believe the instructions in the can. They feel their own need. And if I take a risk and live by faith, what about me? What about my life? What about my relationships? What about my time? What about my investment? What about my talents? So unfortunately, a lot of people don't take the risk. They don't live by faith. They drink the water from the bottle, drop it there, and go on their way. How would you respond if you came across the note? Would, would you risk taking Desert Pete's word for it? Many have come to a place where they wonder, if I live life God's way, if I live by faith, will I get anything out of it? If we actually live by faith, God transforms our expectations, folks. If we live by faith, God will transform your expectations and what it is that you hope to get out of life. Will, will even be transformed. And what you actually get out of life by living by faith is so much more radically powerful, so much more positive, so much more amazing than living life according to the tent that you're not going to be able to contain yourself. If, if you look at a young guy, 30 years old, who wraps his tent in tarps, and say, that dude needs his head examined. You're not going to beat nature. Can we at least give God a chance to cause us to analyze our life? 
and ask ourselves, am I really living by faith? Am I, am I so engrossed in the here and now that I'm failing to see the kingdom that God wants me to build, this, this eternal house in the heavens that God wants me to build? Am I so obsessed with the now that I'm struggling to live by faith? God wants to transform your faith today. And he will if you let him. Not before. You see, well, if God will just prove himself, then I'll then I'll walk by faith. Well, then it's no longer faith. You got to pour the water in the well. Then you get water. If you live by faith, God will transform your expectations for what you would hope to get out of life. And then long after you're gone, some preacher might use you as a sermon illustration because you mattered to them. Because you walked by faith. And when that preacher who's currently a teenager in our church is struggling, they can say, I remembered so-and-so in church who introduced me to Jesus, who loved me like Jesus, who taught me about Jesus. They, they were the tool God used to change my life. This, this is stuff you can't get in a store. You can't drive a golf ball there you can only get it by faith. So will you do me a favor? Do God a favor. At some point, maybe even today, if you have a family, could you just maybe sit down together and just ask the question, how are we doing living by faith? What is it that we could do as a family to express faith together? Are we investing in the tent like that crazy pastor who tries to wrap it and does everything in his power to stop nature from getting in and it got it anyway? Or are we investing in something that, that is eternal and makes a difference in life? Then comes the hard part. If you take a step of faith, this passage tells us the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee. That's better than your insurance, government insurance at the bank, folks. The Holy Spirit guarantees you that he will walk with you and bring that faith to life. I can't believe that for you, but I can tell you that the Holy Spirit will prove himself true in your life. Take a small step of faith. He will prove himself true. And then you can start taking bigger steps of faith. You will, you will never prove God wrong. He'll always keep his word with you. Father, this morning, help us to not be informed. Help us to be formed. Beyond a passage of Scripture, beyond a humorous talk. As we would depart this place today, may the words of this message that you share with us transform our home. That we would have real conversations as teenagers, as parents, as children, as grandparents. And, and we would ask the question, are we living by faith? Are we investing in that which is eternal? Are we investing in that which is temporal? How do we know the difference? What steps can we take to begin to invest more in that which is eternal? Father, in those moments, will your spirit give us excitement? Excitement for what your Holy Spirit could do in and through us in these days. We get out our water bottle, we wet the well, we prime the pump. You have given your spirit to us as a guarantee. Now, Father, in the name of Christ, will you walk with us as we walk by faith? In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.